I've been given the task of preaching about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and in three particular aspects or facets of his work in the baptism and the filling and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And these are all operations of the Spirit. And there are many operations of the Spirit's work in the heart. Uh, We read of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of adoption, or as the Spirit of prayer, the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit of comfort, the Spirit of conviction, the unction of the Spirit, the earnest of the Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit, the intercession of the Spirit. So you can see this is a vast array of operations of the Spirit of God. So I'm, there is, in no way can I address all of them, and I probably cannot address all three of them, but I'll do the best I can. But I want to first begin, uh, let me just say this. If you look at the itinerary of this conference, there's one thing that should stick out to you and is missing. And what is that? It's the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, being born again. Well, the reason for that is that we had a whole uh, conference on it last year. So they want me to preach on these, these operations of the Spirit that flow from the regeneration of the heart. So what I'm going to do, rather than speak on regeneration, is speak on a critical part of that first, because all these operations flow from the indwelling of the Spirit in the heart of the believer. So I want to first begin with a text about the indwelling of the Spirit. Please turn with me to Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. And here we find the necessity of the indwelling of the Spirit. We find the great distinction of a true Christian in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we read in verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh... But in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now the Apostle begins in verse 9 by saying, You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Be it in the Spirit describes a state or a condition that is exactly opposite to being in the flesh. Being in the flesh does not describe a Christian that has fallen into sin. It describes the unregenerate. It describes a life of living after the flesh and the lusts of the flesh. It describes an unbeliever. A Christian is no longer in that state. He is now living in the realm of the Spirit, and therefore under the direction and control of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that leads and rules and governs the life of the believer. And he governs from within. Every believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit and therefore said to be in the Spirit. Paul qualifies this statement if you're in the Spirit. He says, If so be that the Spirit dwells in you. He is saying, This is true, assuming. That the Spirit of God dwells in you. But what a a magnificent fact, a magnificent uh, thing for the believer to know that the Spirit of God dwells within you. If you are regenerate, the Spirit of God dwells within you. If you are born again, the Spirit of God dwells within you. He dwells in every believer on a personal level. He's not just some force or some influence. 
He is the personal Holy Spirit that dwells within your heart. How wonderful, how intimate is this? And how little we think about it. We often think of the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity dwelling in heaven. But the Spirit of God dwells in your heart. And we want to dig into this a little bit. Paul says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's an emphatic statement. If the Holy Spirit does not indwell in you, you are none of Christ. You do not belong to Christ. But on the other hand, conversely, if you are a Christian, then you have the confidence to know that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. But if we don't have the Spirit of God, then we are not of Christ. And Paul makes this emphasis. This is no different than Christ telling Nicodemus, you must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again, unless the Spirit of God had entered into your heart. You implanted life unto death. This is a glorious, sovereign work of God. And every believer, not just a few elite, every believer. The inhabitation of the Spirit is the distinguishing mark of a Christian. Let me say that again. The inhabitation of the Spirit is the distinguishing mark of a Christian. To be without the Holy Spirit is proof that you're none of Christ. That you're outside of Christ. For the indwelling of the Spirit is the bond that brings us into union with Jesus Christ. That is how vital this doctrine of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is. It's absolutely essential and necessary for our salvation. Everything Paul is telling us here is true for all Christians. The indwelling of the Spirit is a universal dwelling, indwelling of all believers. So Paul says, you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. A Christian doesn't walk after the flesh because the spirit is in him. Now I want to look at this word indwelling or to dwell and look a little closer as we consider the indwelling of the spirit. What is the indwelling of the Spirit? Well, in our text that we read, to dwell in you, or the verb to dwell, occurs four times. In the first two occurrences, the the Greek word is okeo. That comes from the word oikos, which is a house. And okeo here is the normal word, verb, for living in a house. Dwelling in a place that you consider your home. And the other occurrence is, a other, is another Greek word, in okeo. And it has the uh, preposition in or in, uh, and so we get the term indwelling. Using these two Greek words, the Apostle Paul refers to this indwelling of the Spirit as Christ in you. The regenerate man is said to have the Spirit of Christ as the consequence of a gracious inhabitation of the Holy Spirit. And I want to consider, uh, Dr. Delcor talked about, there's 60 verses in the New Testament that uh, combine all three persons of the Trinity. In our text is one of those. In verse 9, the Holy Spirit is referred to the Spirit of God. And then at the end of verse 9, he is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. And then in verse 11, the Holy Spirit is referred to uh, as the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. That is the Father. 
Here he raised up Christ from the dead. It's, it's without question the Father. So, thus we are told that the Spirit of God dwells in us, the Spirit of Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of the Father dwells in us. And it's clear from these designations in verses 9 through 11 that the Spirit, God's Spirit, Christ's Spirit, the Spirit of Him raised, that raised up Christ from the dead, the Spirit that dwells in you, all refer to the Holy Spirit. These are simply different ways of expressing the same thing. The variety of titles is by no means meaningless here. It indicates the glory of the unity of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The interchange of these expressions reflect the involvement of the entire Trinity. The Father and the Son indwell the believer through the Holy Spirit. Now, another pertinent pastor um, passage I'd like you to take a look at is John 14, 17. Christ, uh, in his upper room uh, discourse with his disciples on the night that he was arrested, he says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And if a man love me, in verse 23, he will keep my words and my father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. That they abide in us, the father and the son abide in us through the Holy Spirit. In this word, mone, the Greek word for abide. It means to make his home, to take up residence in. So what I'm saying here is that because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, it is also true that the Lord Jesus Christ dwells in us, and it is also true to say that the Father dwells in us. And this is because of the unity of the Trinity. As Dr. Delcor brought out so well last night, now also, I want you to consider that in the New Testament, believers are called the temple of the living God. A temple is a house in which God dwells. So if you turn to, verse, uh, to 1 Corinthians 3.16, we read, here's a rhetorical question. Don't you know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God defile. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Think, how, think of what Paul, the apostle Paul is saying. He says, don't you know this? How often we live our life as if we don't know it. And, and we act as if we're ignorant that the Holy Spirit does not dwell in us or does dwell in us. Paul says, you are the God's temple. And this word for temple, naos, it's a word that is used in the Old Testament of the inner sanctuary of the temple of God. And in particular, the holy of holies. It's a word indicating the presence of God and his holiness. And everything consecrated to God is holy. And Paul says you, about this temple, which you are. You are a temple. You are a sanctuary of the living God. Now this indwelling of the Spirit constitutes every believer. In the Old Testament... If you remember, the Shekinah glory, the glory and presence of God came upon the tabernacle. And there he resided in the tabernacle. And that was his dwelling place. And also, later on in Solomon's temple, the same thing. Amen. 
Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit is everywhere because he's omnipresent, correct? But in a special and specific way, he dwells particularly in every believer. But Paul says some things that are a little bit uh, fearful here. He says, any profanation of the temple was a direct offense to God. If any man defile the temple, he says, then God would destroy him. In the Old Testament, if you defile the sanctuary, it was a death sentence. You were um, severed from the congregation of Israel. For the temple was where the presence of God dwelt. And here's the thing. God is no less jealous of his temple today. And how seriously, in, in that sense, we, we should fear God. He lives within us. He's a holy God. Another text is found in 1 Corinthians 6.19. Now, this is in the context of spiritual uh, immorality. Paul writes, what? Know you not that, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So here, we all know about the uh, sexual immorality of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul is addressing it. And this is how he addresses the Corinthians. He says, don't you know that you are the dwelling place of God? Have you ever considered that you are the dwelling place of God? How can you do this and defile the temple of God? He says, because you're bought with a price. You're not your own. And what was that price? Blood. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who laid down his life. Paid the price for our sin. And redeemed us. We were slaves to sin. And he was the redeemer that redeemed us out of that, that bondage to sin. And we were bought with a price. Amen. That's why. That's why we're not to... Give over to the lusts of the flesh. You know, just think, if your pastor told you, you let's say you're having some mar marriage difficulties, and you say, you know, I got angry with my wife, and, you know, I said some things I should have said, and, you know, the flesh really uh, got to me. And your pastor says, don't you know? that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. This is the way the apostle Paul dealt with his disciples or dealt with that congregation in Corinth. This is the great idea that the believer is a temple and the resident of that temple is God, the Holy Spirit. The believer of the sanctuary the believer is the sanctuary of God. Think of this. And this is just utterly profound. That the most high God, the high and lofty God, the one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, should dwell with man and in man. Amen. Wow. Uh, we can't fathom that. That's a mystery. How does the Holy Spirit dwell within us? Just as God once dwelt within the tabernacle and the temple in a special way, he so now dwells within us. How conscious of this are you? I know our heart gets dulled. I know many things distract us. And we lose track of the sight that we are the temple of God. How glorious is that? that the Holy Spirit takes up residence within you. He who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, dwells within us. 
That, that should just stop right there. That, that, that's absolutely glorious and absolutely profound. And wow. So let me dig a little further. Let's consider some of the characteristics of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Every believer, we've already worked through this based on what Paul said about if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not of Christ. What that means is that every believer has the Holy Spirit. It's a universal indwelling to all believers. And then the second thing that we've spoken about is that the Spirit indwells every believer on a personal level. It's just not some force or influence upon you. This is a personal uh, Holy Spirit. The, sec- the third person of the Trinity. He personally dwells within us. It's a relationship that's intimate whether we know it or not. Christ says, I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he, the Holy Spirit, abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But he, but ye know him for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. So it's an intimate in personal indwelling. Now, let us consider, well, where does the Holy Spirit dwell in us? When the Spirit enters the believer, he enters the whole soul, the heart. The Spirit dwells in the heart. Paul writes in Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just indwell us and influence our thinking and our mind and so forth. He indwells our heart. What is the heart? The heart is all the faculties of our soul, our will, our mind and our understanding, our affections and our conscience. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells the whole heart, the whole man, the whole person. And there he sheds abroad the love of God in our heart. There he induces us to cry out, Abba, Father. For the Spirit of God bears witness to we are the children of God. And how affecting are Paul's words to Timothy. That good thing which has committed unto thee, by the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in you. What is that good thing? The truth of the gospel. But that was committed to Timothy as a minister of God by the Holy Spirit that dwells in him. Well, let's consider in the fourth place, when does the Holy Spirit enter the soul and indwell the believer? The Holy Spirit enters the soul at the point of regeneration. Regeneration is inseparable from the indwelling of the Spirit. In fact, the indwelling of the Spirit in many ways is synonymous with regeneration. When God regenerates some, he regenerates them who are spiritually dead. He implants new life into the soul of man. Man is changed from being dead in sin to alive unto God. And how does the Spirit implant the spiritual life into a spiritually dead soul? By the indwelling of the Spirit. Previous to a sinner's regeneration, previous to the indwelling of the Spirit, the soul was in utter darkness, in a state of total depravity and corruption. The unregenerate is spiritually dead and at enmity with God. But the Spirit enters in. He comes in accordance with the eternal purpose and the counsel and will of God. He comes triumphantly, implanting life into the soul, breathing the, breaking the power of reigning sin in the life and speaking pardon and peace 
to the conscience. The glory of the cross and the redemptive work of Christ is brought to the forefront, and the Spirit takes possession of the heart. And man becomes a temple of the living God, purchased by his Savior's blood. A new creation is made in the soul of man. Life and light enter the soul when the Spirit takes possession and inhabits the heart. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6.16, For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, and this is interesting, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Well, we've considered when the Spirit enters the heart. Now we must ask, how long does the Spirit stay? How long does the Spirit inhabit the heart? Well, brothers and sisters, it's a permanent indwelling. Christ said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit, the comforter, is said to abide in you or with you forever. It's a permanent abode. It's a permanent dwelling. He's not just an occasional visitor. He takes up residence in God's people. He does not pay us a fleeting visit, but he has his home there. He doesn't just come in and and do us for some uh, particular service or empower us for some particular task. He dwells in their permanently, in our heart, permanently. His residence is permanent. And not only in this life, but in the life to come, he dwells in us forever. And finally, as we consider the characteristics of this indwelling, is that number six is that it is a sovereign indwelling. Sovereignty is implied in the term dwell. This is the Holy Spirit's house. It's his residence. We're told, as we spoke about, about, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. And this temple that the Holy Spirit dwells in is his residence. He owns it, and he does with it whatsoever he wills. Previously, we might have been possessed by another owner, even Satan. But the Spirit has depossessed him, and he now dwells within our heart. So that's, that, I just keep, every time I stop and think about that, I think about how, how little I dwell on that, and how important it is to dwell on that, because think about it being a restraining grace. If we ever caught hold of that and had it permanently in our mind that God dwells within us, how it would restrain us from disobeying the Lord and his word. Well, having set the foundation for the operations of the spirit in the life of the believer, I want to go to one of the non-controversial items of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I thank uh, Brother Austin for assigning the, these non-controversial <laughs> operations of the Spirit. Now, as we say, there are many operations, but I think the baptism is where people like to focus on a lot. So let's consider the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a doctrine that's all often misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misapplied. And so it's not my purpose to create controversy here. I just want to provide you with a biblical explanation about the particular operation 
of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And to do that, I want to walk through seven texts. There's only seven texts that mention the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to walk through all seven of them. I'll tell you, I'll tell you my position. I believe it's biblical. And, but I'll leave you to look at those seven texts and come up with your own position. Take my time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the first four texts are found at the beginning of our Lord's ministry when he was baptized by John the Baptist. And they are Matthew 3.11, Mark 1.8, Luke 3.16, John 1.33. And in these texts, you know, the Spirit descends upon Christ, and John makes this prophecy. He makes this prediction, and he compares water baptism with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the same way that John baptized Christ, John was the administrator of the baptism, and water was the element in which Christ was baptized with. And he compares that to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where Christ will baptize in the Holy Spirit, where Christ is the administrator, Christ is the baptizer, and the Holy Spirit is the medium with which we are baptized. So I'll read one of those texts to you where John makes this, well, makes this comparison. John 1, 32 through 33, and all, all the four accounts in each of the Gospels are essentially the same. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit ascend, descending, and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes the administrator with the Holy Ghost, the medium. We do not hear again of the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the Gospels. We do not hear again of the baptism of the Holy Spirit until the ascension of Christ. And it's startling to discover these four Gospels that chronicle the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ have no account of the baptism of the Spirit. So that brings us to our fifth text. In Acts 1.5, we find here Christ making a distinct reference to the promised baptism of the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist prophesied of, that John the Baptist predicted. And just before our Lord's ascension, he told his disciples to wait for the promise of the Father. And here, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is now the promise of the Father. And he, and he refers back to this account of John and his baptism. And he said, John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Well, what's not many days from now? Well, in 10 days would be the Pentecost. And there was a 10-day prayer meeting. And Christ told them to wait. Wait for the promise. He said this, to his disciples in anticipation of the day of Pentecost. This was the promise of the Holy Spirit, which was to be fulfilled. And additionally, we said there's no more text given in the Gospels, but there are some implications. And I'll give you a little bit of those implications. John 7, 37. He said, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly flow rivers of living water, speaking of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive future. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. What did Christ say to his disciples in the upper room? He said, I must go away for me to send you the comforter. And he said this at the point of his ascension when he was talking to his disciples. He had, he was ascended into heaven on high to the right hand of God the Father, all power and glory given to him, all authority. And he sent, as as well as the Father, they sent the Holy Spirit upon his people on the day of Pentecost. Luke 24, 49, Christ tells his disciples that he will send the promise of the Father upon you. So we have to look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit as being identical with the promise of the Father. And when Pentecost came, The promised baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit was fulfilled. What happened on Pentecost? The Bible Bible tells us, we're speaking of the 120 in the upper room, that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, as Christ said in Acts 1.5. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now we have these terms interchangeable. The promise of the Father, the promise of Christ, the gift of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the result of this baptism was that they were filled with the Spirit. And God gave them utterance. Utterance to speak. They were endued with power from on high. See, this: all these terms and expressions refer to the same thing, the same experience. And as one one theologian said, he goes, to make a distinction between these things, you have to have a razor-sharp knife. The New Testament will not allow us to sharply distinguish and and describe these things or interchangeably. Now, what was the result that accompanied the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And there were twofold. There was a manifestation of miracles. And also, there was enablement and empowerment to witness. The miracles were to credential their message. And the miracles they were given were foreign languages. This was Pentecost. People came from all around the world. And we're given a list of, I think, 15 different uh, countries in Acts chapter Two. And they were given what we call tongues. This is basically foreign languages, known languages. Why? To witness to the gospel. Amen. If you're going to preach to someone in a foreign country, you have to know their foreign their language. I go to Nepal and Brother I always has an interpreter. Someone has to interpret what I'm saying. And so they were given this ability to speak in other languages, other foreign languages, miraculously. We're also told uh, that it, the Holy Spirit descended upon them as the sound of a roaring wind. It echoed throughout the city of Jerusalem, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Tongues of fire rested upon them. These are miracles that are never mentioned again in, in the Word of God, but they are pretty um, fantastic, are they not? And if God is credentialing his church, he's credentialing it with miracles here. And we're told the result of this baptism, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Christ said earlier in Acts 1.8, he said, 
you will receive power from the Holy Spirit, and he will come upon you, and you will be, here it is, my witnesses. In Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of earth, the earth. The purpose of foreign languages, the gift of foreign languages, was for the spread of the gospel, was for the witnessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was the inauguration of the New Testament church. It was the credentialing and empowering of the church as God ordained his ordained institution. It's commonly referred to as the birthday of the church. Just as the Shekinah glory or the visible glory of the presence of God came down upon the tabernacle when it was completed and finished, and also Solomon's temple, now the Holy Spirit come down, comes down upon his people in the church. Amen. And the church receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. The descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church marked it out as God's ordained institution to replace the temple worship in J Jerusalem. Now moving on from that aspect of credentialing and empowering the church regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have to consider how the, the spirit baptism worked in the hearts of individual believers on that day. Now, here's an important distinction. We have 120 in the upper room praying for 10 days. They were believers. And so when the Holy Spirit uh, was poured out upon them, it's different because they were already believers. But the 3,000 that were saved, they were not believers. And the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them after, after the, uh, the, the sermon by Peter. And what did... One of the prominent things of Peter's message was a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And so these unbelievers in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost heard Peter's sermon. And they said, what must we do? What did Peter said? Repent. We're also told they believed. And sometimes when he used the word repent, because we know that it's repentance and belief, right? But sometimes one is used, implied the other, and belief is used and implied repentance. Sometimes they're used both together. Anyway, don't want to go off on that. Peter says, repent. And what? Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What they received was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it came upon them, and God entered their heart, it resulted in faith and repentance, in conversion, and they grabbed hold of Christ. And God saved them. And, and Peter tells them that the promise is unto you and to all that are afar off. All of God's elect, the promise came to them on the day of Pentecost. What happened to these people with the where the baptism fell upon them. God poured out his spirit in fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. We're not told they spoke in tongues. We're not told of any miracles when God converted him. Yet it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What are we told? What are we told? That they continued in the doctrine of the apostles. They continued in fellowship. They continued in the breaking of bread. That was the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're told that these people were cut to the heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting us of sin. He's called the spirit of conviction. That word, cut to the heart, pricked, means to stab. And Peter told them to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and for the, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Now here you, here's another important thing you have to uh, put together. The, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not separate from the forgiveness of sins. When the gospel is preached, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the conversion of a sinner is in, con, is, is in concert with the death of Christ, with his atonement, with his work of redemption. Yes, so Peter says, for, for, and you will receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here again, and it's, and it's also used in the next verse we'll look at, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the same as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Faith and repentance are the result of regeneration. And this baptism, this gift comes upon conversion. And 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we are more like the 3,000. In fact, we are just like the 3,000. For when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is at the point of conversion. And it is something that all Christians have. And I take the position that it's a one-time event in the life of a Christian, and it occurs at the point of regeneration. It's that gracious act of the Spirit where he comes to dwell within the believer at the time of conversion. And then we are provided with an array of texts that prove utterly and repeatedly that the Holy Spirit comes personally to dwell in every believer at the time of conversion. For if you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. So, the gift of the Holy Spirit, as I said, is synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have one more text, well, actually two. The sixth text is Acts eleven sixteen. And while Peter was speaking to Cornelius, the Holy Spirit fell on all that heard the word, and they of the circumcision who were with Peter says were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. When giving the brethren at Jerusalem account of an account of this visit to Corinth, uh, Cornelius, Peter declares that this event, which he had witnessed, was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. They received the gift of the, of the Spirit, and Peter calls it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I began, it says in Acts eleven fifteen, and I began to speak. And the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord. How, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What happened here is that Peter is clearly referring to the day of Pentecost. But God had extended this uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit to the Jews. Now it's extended formally to the Gentiles. Amen. Yep, amen, it's us. The baptism of the Spirit is the blessing of regeneration. It's the initial miracle of regeneration where our souls are baptized with the Spirit. When man is baptized, he is born again. And upon the ground of faith and repentance or conversion, man is Spirit baptized. And at that moment, the Spirit takes possession of his heart. Some take this uh, term, baptism of the Spirit, out of context. I'm trying to provide the context for you. And from that, they kind of make a new system of thought using the same terminology. This is, you got to be careful about this. People will use biblical terminology but create their own doctrines from it that are not biblical. But we got to be careful about that. But in, in every case, the reference is not to some blessing subsequent to conversion, but is actually at the point of conversion. A supernatural miracle 
by which the soul passes from darkness into life, from death unto life, from the slavery of sin unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. And this sweeps away, away the view that baptism is a second blessing. It comes with regeneration and conversion. Like the 3,000 at Jerusalem. And there's no warrant in, in, in Scripture for the popular and prevalent idea that the Holy Spirit must be asked for, must be waited for. It's the gift of the Spirit when God saves you and converts you. Amen. And it also sweeps away the notion that man can be born again and yet not have the Holy Spirit. And that some Christians are le allegedly never receive this blessing of the baptism. But I have one more text, and I'm out of time, I know. But I have to be, one more text, okay? <laughs> First Corinthians 12, 13. Here Paul is also recounting the baptism, the spirit baptism at Pentecost. He says, for by one spirit... We are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be uh, bond or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. Now, here's, here's the problem with some of the translations. It says, by one spirit, we have been baptized. But that Greek word, the preposition by, is actually in, or in, and it's the same preposition used in all the six other verses. It should be with the Holy Spirit as the medium by which we're baptized with. Now, another thing that's not apparent in the translations, Dr. Downey, meant, I mean, Dr. Uh, Delcor mentioned the aorist imperative last night. We, we have here an aorist indicative. Baptized, you have been baptized. What is an aorist tense in the Greek language? It's, it's a past tense verb but it points to an event in the past. So Paul is pointing to the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So this is Paul's way of referring back to Pentecost. I know some, some say that this is a different baptism because uh, it makes the Spirit the baptizer instead of Christ. But I just explained that by, by the way of the preposition that's used. So Paul's echoing the words of John the Baptist, and he's emphasizing the oneness of God's Spirit. We're born into the body of Christ. It's a distinctive blessing of the new covenant, and because it is an initial blessing of salvation, it is a universal blessing for all believers. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Stick to it. Amen. Stick to it.